Hello and welcome to Broadcaster's Guide to Microservices. My name is Roger Person and today we are discussing all things microservices within the broadcast and media industry. We have gathered some questions that we have commonly been asked in our demos and exhibitions and thought we would ask our senior developers uh, at next edition to answer them for us. Uh, today I'm joined with uh, by Robert Nagy, lead developer and co-founder of Next Edition, and Jesper Eck, who is a senior developer here at Next Edition. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Roger. Uh, let's crack on with the first question. Uh, maybe it's up to, to you, Robert. Can you just explain what uh, microservice services are and how they are used? So uh, microservices are usually a part of a bigger system, uh, individual parts of a bigger system. And they, um, they are small, vi uh, small parts of software that can run independently. Uh, and then they talk. Uh, these different systems uh, can be run on different hardware, and these, they are talking to each other, and together they m make up the full system. And what makes a microservices architecture different to, to modular software design? Jesper? I think it's uh, not really that different. Um, microservices uh, are a kind of modular software design. Uh, it's just a bit more clear. The lines between the different modules are more, more defined. So uh, you have some defined protocol that the services talk to each other with. Okay. Okay, and in addition there, uh, a big difference is also the fact that microservices can be run on separate pieces of hardware. Oh. While a modular or a design or a monolith always has to run on, uh, on one hardware as a as a whole. Okay, perfect. Question number three, do you need an orchestration layer to call and coordinate microservices to create useful workflows? And is this standardized? And maybe we should start by explaining, Robert, what orchestration layers actually are. Yeah, well, orchestration layers can mean different things depending on the context. Uh, if we start from the lowest uh, uh, layer of what it could mean is uh, how the different microservices are scheduled uh, on different pieces of hardware. So there, there are solutions such as uh, Docker Swarm or Kubernetes, uh, where you basically tell the orchestration uh, system that I want these services run on, these, uh, on hardware with these um, properties, uh, and then the orchestration, uh, uh, orchestration uh, service will schedule the microservices accordingly. And also, for example, if a hardware goes down, it can move the microservices to other available hardware. Uh, other orchestration is more on a functional level, like you have different microservices and how do these uh, microservices speak to each other to actually uh, uh, provide the functionality you're looking for. Like you can have a, a, a database microservice and a search microservice and then the search microservice has to somehow talk with the database. Um, and there are uh, different protocols for this. You can use regular HTTP or some kind of uh, uh, published subscribe-based system. Um, traditionally, in broadcasting industry, you have the MOS, which is uh, very focused on specific things. Um, so that at Next Edition, we have a, um, a very powerful real-time system uh, that uh, where all the Next Edition uh, services communicate with each other. Uh, and then on an even higher level is, you know, how do you set up your system so it uses these different microservices to uh, achieve fun uh, different workflows? For example, you could have uh, uh, when something happens, this render service should, you know, uh, create the uh, transcodes of a video clip. And when that's done, uh, FTP service should upload it somewhere. Uh, and that's uh, not standardized per se. Uh, there are different ways of doing that. Uh, at Next Edition, we use a very uh, what we call a reactive system, where you don't actually set up a, a, um, a task workflow. We we work more with data workflows that seamlessly uh, emerge uh, from uh, uh, the configuration. Great. Um, and to you, Jesper, next question here: Can you get a microservices environment off the shelf? So I would say that's also a uh, difficult question. I would start by saying that many, uh, many uh, software sort of microservices are sold as 
uh, a service that you need to somehow integrate into a system. So that makes it kind of a microservice. You could also say that next edition as a product, uh, I mean, since it's a microservice environment, uh, it is, uh, you can get it off the shelf. Yeah, because when you you buy a server, more or less, it's it's already ready to 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 um, to be used, so to speak. Yes. So when you buy a server from Next Edition, for example, it's already set up uh, with the uh, service orchestration configuration. So it's basically just uh, plugging in the machine uh, in your existing Next Edition's form, and then Next Edition will automatically schedule uh, all its services accordingly to achieve best performance and availability. Okay, thank you. So, um, does the microservices architecture deliver efficiencies and power? And Jens, please elaborate on this. Maybe you can start, Robert. Uh, yes. So, um, uh, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the advantage of uh, microservices becomes um, uh, evident when you compare it with a non-microservice-based architecture, because then you need to have one specific piece of hardware for each different functionality. With a microservice architecture, you can have one piece of hardware that is doing multiple things and it's dynamically configured. So you, you can have one service that does database and, and search and transcoding, etc., in a shared environment. And then it becomes more of a question of having more servers becomes more of a question of availability and performance, and it's not a question of functionality. I think also uh, in terms of development, there are many ben benefits, such as uh, uh, it, it's much easier to replace a single part. Uh, it also um, helps when updating the system. So when updating, uh, you, you can update a single component without affecting the rest of the system. And you also have um, the failover. So instead of the entire system failing, you only have a smart, small part of the system failing uh, in case there is like a hardware failure or a, a power failure or something. That, that, that is actually a very good point. Uh, when we do next edition upgrades, uh, a lot of the time, uh, next edition upgrades or maintenance or failovers for, for that matter, uh, usually the uh, users don't notice because we're only updating small parts of the system at the time uh, and they quickly recover. So, so basically the system is still operational while this is happening. Uh, we've also done uh, bug fixes uh, uh, on live systems without uh, the users noticing anything. This is not possible in a non-microservice uh, environment because there you have to restart huge parts of the system and that means it just stops while that's being done. Uh, and of course, uh, you could, for example, have uh, two replicas of a service. And when you're updating, you update one first, and then the, the, the old is still running. And then once the new one has started, that's when you start killing the other one. And that way, you basically have zero downtime on that specific service. And I think that's a little bit about next edition in general. I would say to take take uh, to care of headaches, to eradicate her headaches, and there's a lot of headaches around uh, uh, updates, etc. Et, et Final question, Jens: Is it only suitable for the cloud, or can you build a microservice architecture for yourself? So I think uh, what's being asked here is private cloud versus uh, remote cloud. So for example, do you buy your own servers? Mm -hmm. You can buy your own servers, and, uh, or next edition servers for that matter, install them on premise, and then you have your cloud. Uh, you can also run it uh, up in the sky, so to say, at Amazon or Google or Microsoft or other uh, suppliers. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, upsides and downsides of each. Uh, the, the primary advantage of having it on-premise is uh, you remove the um, availability issue of uh, internet connection. So you have to be able to uh, have a connection to Amazon, etc. And that connection needs to have low latency and high bandwidth. And this is probably on a public internet something very difficult to guarantee. It's d difficult to give quality of service guarantees when you're going that way. And when you have uh, functionality and workflows that depend on high availability, low latency, high bandwidth, uh, then that can be a challenge. So there, there are advantages to having it on-premise. 
Uh, of course, the, the downside of having on-premise is uh, you need to have uh, you know, a server room or, or some kind of uh, location to put the service in, and they have to be maintained. I think uh, when talking on this topic, a lot of people think you have to choose one of the options. I think uh, uh, the most powerful solutions combine these two. So you have uh, private um, cloud, so to say, so, uh, on-premise yeah, on servers. And then you combine that with the power of uh, cloud where you can get, you know, like infinite storage or uh, uh, use the the uh, like AI tools that are avail available in the cloud and so on. So there are a lot of benefits of combining the, the, these two worlds. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, you, if you have this on-premise uh, server, then you can more efficient, you get a really efficient workflow when like uploading big files and uh, you have a high bandwidth streams, which you don't want to run through the cloud. So yeah, combining the, the, the two worlds. A, a, a big advantage uh, the uh, remote clouds have or public clouds is it's very easy to scale up. So if you need more storage or more CPU power, it's just as a press of a button. While on on-premise, you have to order a, a server from Mr. Roger, and it uh, takes a little time for it to arrive. Uh, so what, what we're looking at and actually already doing to a certain degree is having, as Jesper mentioned, having storage in the cloud. So we all the files are quickly uploaded uh, on-premise to Next Edition. And then a Next Edition um, in the background uh, moves uh, files up to the cloud, uh, you know, the high quality versions that are not used for playout. So we try to keep, you know, playout and proxies on premise and then upload the original high quality ones that are infrequently accessed uh, up to the cloud. Uh, and that way we're able to extend how much media is actually possible to put into next edition. Uh, likewise with uh, rendering and transcoding, uh, high uh, bandwidth, uh, high priority jobs, we can run on premise. And uh, if you have, uh, for whatever reason, you want to uh, transcode lots of uh, media at the same time and you want it quickly, you could uh, boost it with the cloud. So you just uh, spawn up more, uh, some of the next edition uh, render services on the cloud as well and let them be rendered there at an extra cost, of course, because uh, uh, moving the uh, file, if it's not already in the cloud and the uh, machines running in the cloud will cost extra. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, most enlightening. Uh, if you like the video, you can find more uh, from us by subscribing to our YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, don't forget to share this either. Remember, information sharing is caring. See you on the next one.